Good evening. We welcome all of you to this uh, evening session and this particular on pharmacovigilance. And uh, this webinar has been uh, organized or prepared by the Empower School of Health, yeah, in collaboration with the uh, Global Fund. And we have uh, Mr. Shimelis from Global Fund uh, this evening. Thank you very much, Shimelis, for making it up. Yeah. And uh, we welcome all of you. We have different participants uh, from different countries. Please, we encourage you to use the chat box to introduce yourself. And uh, it's also good, like you write your email address so that if someone needs a contact from your country or your organization, we can start the networking from there. So I welcome all of you in this uh, important station. Uh, we expect it to be very interactive, sharing experiences, and let us use the chat box as much as we can as to pose questions and uh, comments and suggestions so that we have a very interactive uh, session. Next. So as I said, uh, this, uh, the webinar is on pharmacovigilance, and uh, we also have uh, TMDA from Tanzania, Tanzania Medicines and Medical Devices Authority, Regulatory Authority. Yeah, so we also expect to hear something from them. Yeah, this evening in the comments, in the questions, you know. So the main agenda for this uh, evening is uh, particularly to go through, uh, I, I can say, an understanding about pharmacovigilance, but it's also about creating awareness on the topic itself. Yeah, and uh, we are expecting, yeah, first we go through the housekeeping, like how are we going to manage ourselves in this one hour and a half. But uh, also we have a poll, we have two polls, and the first poll is basically to understand who is here, you know, and we, I'll, talk, I'll take you through the webinar objectives, and then we'll have an opening remarks from Mr. Shimelis uh, from Global Fund, yeah, and then I'll also introduce our expert this uh, evening, uh, Dr. Sangita. And uh, then we'll have the presentation. Then at the end, we expect to have a Q&A session. And then we'll have the post-webinar call. So this is what is expected of us. So in terms of housekeeping, we request all of you, please, to mute your microphones and turn off your video. Please mute your microphone and turn off your video so that we can have a better uh, internet connection. Yeah, so I request all participants to mute your microphones and turn off your videos, but we'll ask you to turn them up at the end of the session. And then, as I said, please use the chat box to ask as many questions as you can, but also to give comments and suggestions, even if you think like uh, there's more interesting areas that we should talk about, use the chat box to give your recommendations. And uh, the same, use the chat box also to ask your questions, but also during the Q&A, please feel free to raise up your hand. I think we all know the icon on raising up your hand so that you can be given an opportunity to ask a question. But when we are asking you like uh, to ask a question or to speak, please unmute your microphone and turn on your video so that we can be able to, uh, to interact. But you should also note that the slide deck will be shared at the end of the session. Like everybody, we get, every, every one of us will get the PowerPoint presentations, but we will also get you a certificate of uh, attendance uh, at the end of the session. Yes, next. So now we have our pre-webinar poll assessment. Please try to answer the questions. So we have a few questions here. Just trying to understand who is in this group. Please answer the questions. Please, yes, please. Please answer the questions. I'm asking, I'm requesting all participants to answer the questions. Yeah. 
Dear participants, please answer the questions. We'll appreciate to see you uh, attending the poll. Yeah. We are still waiting for you to answer the questions in the pre-webinar uh, assessment. Thank you. Yeah, we still need more of you. Please join and answer the questions. It's a very simple one, very quick, but very important. Thank you. Please, more. Can you join more? We need more people to answer the questions. Please, can we get more? Let's do it quick so that we don't take time. Yeah, we should not eat the time for the presentations. Thank you. Can we get more people attending the poll? Please. Thank you. More, please. We are almost there. It's a very simple one. Please attend to it. So now we have 60% of the participants who uh, attended the poll. Maybe we can end the poll there. Yeah, let's end the poll. It is 66% now. Okay, thank you. So 66% uh, of those who have uh, registered and they are enrolled in this webinar, they are, um, uh, in terms of gender, it is realized that a majority are male, that is 79%. Uh, so we have, uh, we have less of the females here, they are just represented by 21%. And uh, in terms of the age group, uh, in terms of the age group, uh, uh majority are young people that is 39 percent these are people of less than 30 years but uh close to uh the middle age that is we have people from 30 to 40 and this is 36 percent so it's not uh, there's no significant difference between the younger and this uh, uh middle age group so we can generally say that we have more youth uh in this group and in terms of our geographical area 46% are from Tanzania, so majority are Tanzanians, and then followed by uh, Kenya, uh, Rwanda, that is the Rwanda, East African region and other regions, that is uh, 18%. And we have 11% from West Africa and 7% from uh, the Southern Africa. In terms of educational background, 61%, uh, and those are the majority, they actually have a bachelor's degree. So this is very good. And then that one was followed by 32% who have a master's degree. So majority, they have a, a bachelor degree. And in terms of professionalism, 39% um, uh, they're actually healthcare professionals, okay? And they were followed by 18% um, uh, who are the pharmaco pharmacologists, pharm pharmacologists and then also 18% are supply chain uh, specialists. So majority of the people that we have here are healthcare professionals and uh, followed by uh, the farm uh, pharmacologists and also the supply chain uh, experts. In terms of uh, work experience, uh, the poll indicate that uh, majority have less than five years uh, of work experience, and that one was estimated at 57%. And we have also uh, a good number of people between six and 10 years of work experience, and that one is estimated at 25%. Uh, in terms of uh, information on the webinar, uh, majority indicated that they had the, uh, the way about the webinar through the social media, that is Facebook, LinkedIn, LinkedIn. And then we also had about 43 who had the information through emails. So the main source of uh, information were emails and social media. And uh, there's also a question on whether one is a member or an alumni of uh, whether uh, 
the Global Fund or Empower, School of Health Pharmace Pharmaceutical Society or Council. And uh, according to the poll, is that a uh, majority of the people are from the pharmaceutical society or council of their countries. And that one is uh, 46%. So this shows that a majority of the people have a farmer's background. Yeah. So that is the end of the poll. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone who participated in this. So the main objectives of this uh, webinar, as I say, the, uh, the subject is on pharmacovigilance, but uh, we expect that uh, after this um, webinar, you'll be able to understand what is pharmacovigilance, but you'll also be able to understand the importance of reporting adverse drug reaction, ADRs, and you also be able to understand the role of pharmacovigilance in improving patient safety. And you also be able to understand the different types of ADRs. And at the same time, you'll be able to understand the different stakeholders in reporting ADRs and their role. Yeah, and you also learn about methods of reporting ADRs. And at the end of the day, you also be able to learn different patient service solutions for minimizing the ADR. So this is uh, the basic, uh, the, I can say the main focus of this uh, webinar that we expect to ponder in the next one hour and let's say 15 minutes. Yeah, thank you, next. So as I said, uh, we have a guest speaker and uh, who is going to give us an opening remarks. And this is uh, Mr. Shimelis Bellanay from uh, Global, Fine, Global Fund. He's uh, the supply chain specialist in country supply chain management. And uh, he has uh, more than nine years of experience yeah, working with country teams and stakeholders to implement health supply chain transformation and contributing to the overall strategy that addresses the core objective of the Global Fund. Because the Global Fund is so much interested in strengthening uh, the health commodity supply chains. But also Shimelis has been collaborating with other teams to conduct supply chain diagnostics in 20 Global Fund supported countries and subsequent capacity building depending on countries' maturity level, priorities, and willingness. And this is includes Tanzania, that uh, the Global Fund has been supporting and strengthening our health commodity supply chain. So, uh, there's been support to the Ministry of Health, support to the, uh, to the medical stores department. So there's a lot of support that we have received as a country, and we really appreciate uh, this uh, uh, from Global Fund. But he's also uh, overlooking the rollout uh, of a supply chain transformation initiative in high burden and high impact countries in Africa and Asia. So this is briefly about Mr. Shimelis. And may I take this opportunity to welcome you uh, to officially open this webinar. Welcome, Shimelis. Thank, thank you, Gladys. Can, can you hear me? Uh, can we stop sharing the screen, please? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunities. As uh, you introduced me, I'm uh, a Global Fund employee working in the supply chain department, primarily focusing on strengthening supply chain systems. Um, across high impact Africa one, two, and the Asian countries. Um, as, as you know, Global Fund is highly commoditized grant. We spend uh, 60 to 80 percent of our multi million dollar grants um, into you know, the purchase, the procurement, warehousing, and distribution of commodities. And uh, uh, quality and safety of this commodity and part in the parcel of um, our intervention. Um, in that aspect, um, even though we are not directly involved in pharmacovigilance, which is the reporting of adverse events, but uh, we, we play our part in uh, ensuring the quality. Um, and in that aspect, we are also using technology uh, in some countries. Right now we are uh, in Ghana, we are piloting a GS1 enabled uh, barcoding system, which is, um, you know, technologies that generate barcodes at the central warehouse. And um, that barcode it, it is tracked until 
with the mobile device until it is the commodity, the pharmaceutical uh, product is delivered at health facility level. So in that, that at least by doing so, we reduce the counterfeiting, the diversion, which definitely will play part in, in uh, you know, any adverse impact that comes through, you know, bad quality of the commodity. And similarly, we are doing, uh, I'm also doing um, a GS1 proof of concept in Uganda, where we are doing a roadmap and costing of um, this um, rollout of GS1 systems, at least for the locally manufactured uh, pharmaceutical products. So in a nutshell, what I would like to say is going forward, we'll invest more and more in countries in, in you know, to use technology to, to track commodities, um, to, you know, to, 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 to track and trace commodities so that we ensure quality and safety um, while you know, in the warehouse or during transportation. With that, I would um, um, wish you a good uh, training or workshop or collaborative engagement and um, pick up, keep up the good job. And thank you for the opportunity again. Have a great day, have a nice weekend. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Shimelis. Yeah, thank you. Can we now continue with the presentations, please? Yeah. Now, uh, I'd like to introduce our main speaker. And uh, this is uh, Dr. Sangita Sharma, who is a professor from the Department of Neuropsychopharmacology, Institute of Human Behavior and Allied Sciences. She's also a president at the new, at the Delhi Society for Promotion of Rational Use of Drugs. Her qualification and certifications are that she's an MD, pharmacology, and uh, she has a QM, and uh, should, I think she will explain more for herself, but she also has an MBA. Uh, she also has a qualification from the Harvard Medical School Quality Leadership Program. These are the certificates and the Baldridge Excellence Framework for Healthcare Award. She's also a certified external assessor. She's actively working in the forefront of promoting rational use of medicines, especially antimicrobial use, medication safety, quality, and quality in healthcare. Uh, she's rich and diversified in, uh, professionally and with uh, an extensive major experience in healthcare. And she has conducted more than 300 workshops to build a capacity for doctors, nurses, and pharmacists. And one of her pioneering work is a book known as Standard Treatment Guidelines, a manual for medical therapeutics, which is in its sixth edition. The first edition was published in 2002. And uh, she's uh, and uh, several Indian states have adapted or adopted this particular book. So you can also look for it. But she's also serving on the ethics committee of several national and academic institutions. She's a state nodal officer for AMR containments, daily state. So she maybe she also talk more about herself. Uh, Dr. Sangita, would like to welcome you for the presentation. Yeah, thank you very much for being ready uh, to be with us this evening. You are welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Gladness, for your kind introduction. Uh, Shiny, can you allow uh, sharing, screen sharing? Yes, uh, you are allowed, Dr. Shandita. You can share the screen. Allow. Uh, uh, yes, please try. Okay. Ah, now, now it's okay. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, it's visible. Okay. Uh, good. Good. I think it's uh, good afternoon for you. Good evening for me here in India. Uh, greetings from India to all of you. Thanks for joining in. Thanks, Gladness, uh, for introduction and Empower uh, School of Health for inviting me to share, uh, uh, you know, uh, my views about uh, 
pharmacovigilance, what it is. And I heard, uh, you know, many of you are pharm pharmacists working in the, um, you know, forefront uh, with the uh, patients. So, you know, this uh, session is quite important for all of Our us. Sister. Okay, uh, you know, I think uh, you all know, uh, you know, William Osler said, and it describes very well the importance of the uh, topic today, the person who takes medicine must recover twice, once from the disease and once from the medicine. That means the medicines are uh, double-edged sword, you know, if they have actions, they have side effects or adverse effects too. So, you know, uh, but, you know, in this era of patient safety, you know, dying from a disease sometimes is unavoidable, but dying from a medicine is unacceptable. So no harm should happen to any patient, uh, you know, because of our management. That's the goal of all of us here who are working with the uh, in healthcare profession. But, uh, you know, as you know, uh, you know, drugs have, they, they have, it is inherent. This is the nature of the medicine, modern medicine, that if they have effect, they have side effects too. So you can't, you know, sometimes avoid having these side effects. But uh, all of this became very, very important for us. You know, after this thalidomide incident, there was a public uh, outcry, huge outcry about this because between 1950s to 60s, more than, you know, around 10,000 to 20,000 children were born uh, with the congenital difficulty called pocomilia. You all so must have heard of this, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, you, if you see the picture, this is quite horrifying. And this happened all over the world in 46 country. So this led to a drug regulatory outcry, you know, you know, uh, you know, the drug regulatory authority had to step in and uh, there was a pressure to, uh, you know, make preclinical testing and cl clinical evaluation of drugs before mar marketing, uh, this should be rigorous. And uh, there was a great increase in awareness about adverse effects of drugs and methods of detecting them after this uh, Thalidomide incident. Now, you know, as the word, the uh, pharmacovigilance stands for, this is science and activities related to detection, assessment, understanding and prevention of adverse effects. The aim is to detect that we assess on timely manner, understand what these are, you know, and what are the other problems associated with the use of a uh, particular drug. And the, it deals with, you know, range from clinical development to post-marketing phase. You know, it doesn't end, you know, uh, you know during clinical trials, we do study uh, these uh, uh, effects and side effects uh, of a drug in depth, but the number of patients exposed to the study drug are not very good. So it extends to the post-marketing phase as well. So, and it just, you know, it deals with the entire spectrum of the, uh, you know, uh, drug approval process. Uh, in simpler terms, if I have to say, pharmacovigilance is an aspect of patient care you know, leave aside the, you know, official definition of uh, pharmacovigilance. This is an aspect of patient care that seeks to make the best use of medicines available. And the medicines which are available for prevention, treatment, uh, so that we can treat them without undesired effects. So before I go into the, you know, uh, details of the pharmacovigilance, let's understand the two terms uh, well, you know, which we very often use and very often people get confused between uh, these two terms. Adverse events are, you know, uh, when any injury happens, uh, you know, to a patient during our medical management. Uh, you know, rather than the underlying condition of the patient. We know uh, that the patients come to hospital, they have suffered from serious uh, illnesses, they, their illness progresses, complications develop. Uh, all those things are natural uh, process of the disease, but anything which happens because of our management, any injury or harm, uh, that is called adverse event. So there is no causal relationship, you know, uh, with the drug or this thing. 
but we call this as an adverse drug reaction when the response to a drug uh, you know is unintended uh, or which occurs noxious you know which causes discomfort to the patient and this happens at a normally used doses we are not talking about overdosages we are not talking about non-compliances here. We are not talking about therapeutic failure here, but something undesirable, unintended, uh, noxious effects happening, uh, you know, because of our uh, medicine treatment. So there is a causal relationship between all these things happen because of a medicine. And largely, we understand these are non-preventable, uh, but, uh, you know, we will see, you know, whether this can be reduced. But if you, if you are talking about quality and, uh, you know, you cannot separate it from safety. So uh, the, both these things are very much linked to each other, while uh, most of the uh, harm caused by, you know, is uh, uh, by our medical management is avoidable, but largely adverse drug reactions are unavoidable. Uh, some people are also, you know, because these are unintended, undesirable, unexpected. So we may have to discontinue a medication, uh, you know, th this may uh, lead to hospitalization of a patient or prolong uh, hospitalization of a patient may result in a disability or uh, maybe life threatening sometimes, you know, allergic reaction and all that sometimes uh, death uh, or congenital an anomalies may happen. So, uh, sometimes these are mentioned in the package insert of the uh, new product or the drugs which we are already using for many uh, years, uh, but uh, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, unexpected side effects may also appear which are, which are not mentioned in the package inserts of the uh, uh, medical product. Uh, we call them serious adverse events, SAEs. This is uh, commonly, uh, you know, uh, reported uh, because any untoward uh, medical occurrence that leads to death which is life-threatening, which leads to hospitalization or prolongation of existing hospitalization results in uh, persisting uh, disability or congenital. So these are the serious adverse events, you know, uh, which should never happen uh, with any drug medical product that we have. Then we have other, uh, uh, you know, Terms which you which are used ADR case reports signals you know benefit risk analysis these are the terms which we commonly use as the name suggests case report uh, um, is you know whenever any unexpected side effect appears or if there is any um, lab test abnormality or which is suspected or induced by a medical product, then we call this as an ADR case report. We uh, signal is when uh, you have, uh, you know, uh, three or four or more case reports, uh, reported information is with, with you and you where you find that there may be a uh, causal relationship between an adverse event and a drug, um, the relationship being unknown uh, or incompletely documented previously. So we call this as a signal. And then based on this signal, as you get more and more reports of ADR, then the uh, this goes into the, uh, this information goes into the yeah. package insert. Then uh, there is another term called uh, benefit with analysis. Uh, can you mute yourself? Uh, those, uh, can you mute yourself? Uh, can you mute yourself? Sorry. Yeah. Please. Sorry, everyone. Can you mute yourself? <laughs> Dr. Sharma, you're on mute. Ah, you muted me also. 
so as I said, medication errors, uh, the un uh, universe, what is the, uh, you know, how do you place these, each of these uh, terminology that I use, uh, while, uh, you know, harm caused by adverse events is this, uh, adverse drug reactions could be, you know, part of this, and, uh, you know, uh, out of this small number could be the serious adverse events. You know, you may suspect more of uh, this to be, uh, you know, because of the medicine, but actually uh, the adverse drug reaction may be, uh, you know, this much, you know, rest of it, you know, if there is an error uh, in medication administration or dispensing or prescribing, you know, this may exaggerate the adverse event, uh, you know, they, they, they may have, you know, synergistic effect, complementary effect on it, but uh, the size of the adverse, re re this is the relationship, while uh, medication errors are totally avoidable. One need not suffer from these errors while uh, getting medical care, but ADR reactions are inevitable, uh, but uh, of course, in my experience, I feel largely even adverse drug reactions can be reduced, harm caused by adverse drug reactions can be reduced if we are vigilant about it. So if, if we have to talk about in terms of uh, uh, drug safety and uh, pharmacovigilance, this, they, uh, this is concerned, pharmacovigilance is concerned with two outcomes, safety and efficacy. So that means we need to see that whether a drug works or not, or is it safe or not. So th that means this is touching every aspect of drug life cycle from pre-clinical development to post-marketing surveillance. Uh, you know, this uh, entails educating patients, uh, reporting of uh, risk and benefit and uh, you know, why are these adverse drug reactions a problem? We know, you know, it can lead to serious uh, uh, events. You know, besides that, can you tell me, can you write it in the chat box? Why are ADRs a problem? Why are we so much bothered about this? And okay, let me put it this way. How can we make uh, drug use more safe? You can write in the chat box. I can see the chat box. Okay, uh, some uh, adverse drug reactions are fatal, very good. Uh, usually some of them are unexpected, can lead to death, interruption of patient care, can lead to non-compliance. Yes, very good. Anything about the size of the problem? Yes, very good. Economic burden? Yes, definitely. Igno uh, the ignorance and non-compliance? Uh, yes, this uh, ADRs would be more troublesome if there is ignorance or non-compliance, uh, uh, but uh, okay. Irrational use of drugs, very good. Okay, let's see the, uh, you know, the size of the polypharmacy may lead to, yeah, these are the reasons, you know, uh, for ADR, but uh, we are concerned about ADR because the, because of the size of the problem, more than 40% of the patients in the community experience ADR, and out of this 80 to 30% of inpatients have an ADR, and uh, which leads to more, uh, around 5% of hospital admission, uh, admissions. Then around 30% are severe. They can be fatal in one in thousand <laughs> medical inpatients and they complicate uh, drug therapy, you know, because you need more uh, drugs for treatment, a uh, patient uh, may deteriorate, uh, it may decrease compliance and delay cure and affect poor quality of life. Yes, very good. You know, you've already uh, mentioned that. So how reporting would be beneficial? Can you write in the chat box? How reporting would be beneficial? Hmm. 
Improve product development, yes. Uh, to prevent further damages, yes, very good. Can help prevent, okay, ADRs, improves drug profile, yes. Makes clear causality factors and attribution to medicines. Uh, you can monitor drug-drug interactions, yes. Drug quality, uh, Okay, uh, to enhance and improve drug quality. Let's see, what do you mean by that? Will help in sensitization in drug use, uh, help to support the victim. Okay, you can find out the ways of uh, minimizing the errors. Uh, helps in drug scheduling by drug regulatory authority. New, uh, okay, new clinical indications. Okay, very good. Drug reconciliation can reduce, yes, very good. Okay, it improves quality of, yes, you've got it right. Uh, uh, it can help you, okay, very good. Uh, in doing the product recall, yes, uh, uh, okay. So, uh, you know, this uh, particularly the ADR reporting is beneficial. It will help you in preventing uh, development of tragedies from users. Like we don't want repetition of thalidomide tragedy, you know, and uh, we have seen, uh, you know, several drugs have been withdrawn from the market because of the, uh, you know, uh, reporting of the ADR, which were unacceptable. So several drugs have been, you know, withdrawn from the market. So it helps you uh, in making uh, it safe, you know. Then um, because uh, it can influence the ADR labeling, in, you know, we largely we depend on the package insert, you know, the indications, contraindications, precautions. So reporting of this will help influencing the uh, labeling, you know, that this drug should not be used in depression, uh, De, uh, depressed patient or patients with urinary problems or uh, things like that, you know. Uh, many drugs have uh, had, um, uh, you know, labeling revised because of the ADRs. So uh, scarce data, if you do not have a proper data, uh, then uh, regulatory action on questionable drugs cannot be taken. So it strengthens the regulatory uh, authorities to decide whether to continue with a particular drug uh, in a country or, you know, whether it needs improvement. Uh, warning. So we need uh, pharmacovigilance. Uh, basically, it is ethical, uh, you know, ethics at the bottom. It is unethical to, you know, give unsafe medications to our fellow men. And uh, it is uh, important for promoting rational use of medicines and adherence to treatment because uh, ADR may, uh, in, uh, you know, interfere and patient may stop uh, the treatment or may not take the uh, drug as prescribed or as per prescribed schedule and it may harm the patient and above all it is the humanitarian concern that we should make our world safe for everyone so do you think uh, uh, all uh, ADRs are reported do you think all uh, ADRs are uh, reported no no very good why no Yes, and then the next question is why no? Uh, I, I think um, uh, one of the biggest problems in uh, our settings, especially in the, uh, developing countries, is that uh, there is underreporting of adverse uh, drug uh, reactions. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that means that there are a lot of uh, ADRs which happens and it goes unreported. The very yes. few get reported. Very good, very good. So, uh, um, sorry, I also think that many people do not know the importance of reporting an ADR. Yes. In certain yes. systems. Yes. yes. 
definitely uh, not all adrs are reported only 2 to 4% of all adrs are reported so under reporting you know you can imagine the extent of under reporting you know you can consider as uh, next to not being reported and only 10% even the serious ones only 10% of them are reported so you know and this happens because we assume that this this has already been uh, known or somebody else might have been uh, you know already uh, you know reported this so uh, you know the bottom line here is that never assume that someone else will uh, you know uh, report for you and we cannot depend on the clinical trials for adr information because we, uh, very few patients are used here and the uh, you know patients included in clinical trials are very simple uh, we are not taking any complicated cases here and the scope of the clinical trial is very narrow you're looking for a effect on a particular indication only whereas in practice you find that people use it for various reasons uh, for uh, in various doses along with various other uh, medicines and the exposure during clinical trials is a limited one only the common ones are revealed uh, in the clinical clinical trials, the uh, rare ones, you know, those uh, beyond uh, one is two thousand, uh, uh, you know, frequency uh, will not be reported in the clinical trials. So, and also, you know, during clinical trials, as you know, uh, the very young, very old uh, patients, pregnancy, children, they are excluded from the clinical trials. Whereas in practice, all of these medica medications are being used in all these uh, age groups. So we, we cannot rely only on the clinical trials for reporting. And also we need to have our own uh, reporting system in the country because international differences because of the ratio difference, uh, the disease prevalence, genetic, social and the cultural, uh, you know, milieu, the beliefs, the healthcare systems, the practices, you know, and indications for the use may be different. So, uh, you know, each one of us, each country has to have a system in place for reporting of these uh, adverse drug reactions and these ADRs, you know, let's quickly go through, you know, the classification just to recapitulate, you must be knowing all these things just to, you know, so that uh, recapitulate, I'm just going through the ADRs could be acute, subacute, latent, depending on the onset of event and it, you can also classify them uh, based on the uh, frequency this is important uh, you know to know you know very often we use these terms interchangeably that this is very common or common but we should know you know when we say very common it means one in ten patients uncommon is when in a thousand patients rare is you know when we are talking about one in ten thousand and uh, very rare is one in uh, you know one lakh or ten uh, uh, million uh, patients. Uh, th this gives you the idea about, you know, what is the frequency of these adverse effects or oh, and then you can also divide uh, you know classify them on the basis of duration temporary permanent or severity as mild moderate and severe uh, mild could be bothersome but requires no change in therapy this is very important a moderate is a severe is disability disabling or life threatening that you mean you have to stop these medicines moderate would be in between requires some intervention you may either have to uh, decrease the dose or you may have to uh, add another drug uh, for moderately severe reactions but do understand i want to emphasize here uh, you know many times we mix up between serious and severe severe is not same as serious severe maybe is the intensity it is based on the intensity you may have a severe headache but this headache may not be serious. But if there are red flag signs, uh, the headache may be serious. The head, you know, when uh, it is accompanied with dizziness, uh, uh, you know, uh, or neurological symptoms, then it becomes serious. Uh, allergic reaction, hypersensitivity reactions, uh, you know, the uh, reactions are serious. So seriousness is based on the outcome. So it may it is a measure of degree of 
harmfulness of the event whereas severity is based on intensity uh, you know how uh, you know uh, a person may be feeling at that time so uh, please do not use these terms uh, interchangeably okay so these are some of the common allergic reactions you may which may you may be coming across but the serious drug reactions are toxic epidermal necrolysis steven johnson syndrome and drug hypersensitivity syndrome these are very severe patient may die and it needs immediate attention uh, of the healthcare provider and the drug uh, the offending drug needs to be stopped immediately then uh, severe as i told you uh, hypersensitivity reactions these are very severe this happen you know you have to be ready for dealing with this you know you just have 3 to 5 minutes with you you know otherwise it can be fatal so uh, in the preparedness you have to have a right treatment with adrenaline uh, readily available with you so you, uh, knowledge of the drugs which can cause hypersensitivity reaction you be prepared you give a test dose be prepared and uh, with a crash uh, you know cart with the adrenaline uh, you know that will help you in saving the patient then uh, adrs can be classified based on the type Uh, type a are augmented reaction these are the extended effect pharmacological effects of the drug so these tend to be fairly common usually one in 100 so and they are responsible for two thirds of adr often these are predictable and dose dependent uh, you know for example you have given a, a medicine for uh, hypertension a drug will you know cause normal tension and the type a reaction would be hypotension when the bp goes below the normal level so similarly hyperglycemia you give oral hyper uh, glycemic agents or insulin uh, you glycemia is achieved and because the do if the dose is too high uh, or the you know because of other reasons the patient may also uh, experience hypoglycemia so these are all examples of type a reaction so knowledge of the pharmacological effect and what could happen if the pharmacological effect is exaggerated can uh, you know tell you what kind of it and what action needs to be taken so uh, in you know all these uh, you need to just reduce the dose or withhold the drug or consider effect of concomitant therapy any drug which is exaggerating this pharmacological effect the two drug you know independently for example non steroidal uh, anti inflammatory drugs pain killers analgesics uh, you know they cause fluid retention and in if you are using uh, in hypertension it may increase the blood pressure or in independently they are not sedative but when you use them uh, with the anti histaminic sedation may be more so knowledge of these type a reaction will help you in better management of these patients uh, type b means bizarre reactions these are anaphylactic reactions these are genetic uh, but they are very rare uh, so uh, chloramphenicol induced aplastic anemia hypersensitivity reactions these are all examples of uh, types of uh, bizarre reactions uh, with these medicines some adrs will appear on chronic use so these are type c these are time related or dose related aminoglycoside gentamicin given for a short duration may be well tolerated but if you give in give it for a longer period it can cause ototoxicity it can cause renal toxicity ethambutol can lead to optic uh, toxicity similarly you know there are many other examples steroids given uh, for a longer time on chronic use can uh, you know uh, you know depress this hypothalamic pituitary axis so lead to suppression of corticosteroids so again the remedy the solution in these cases is reduce the dose or withhold withdrawal may have to be uh, prolonged because uh, to avoid this uh, uh, you know that means that is why some drugs 
you know, we always say that do not stop abruptly. You know, you have to taper. Steroids is one of examples. Aminoglycosides should not be given for a prolonged time because otherwise it can cause toxicity. Then type D are the delayed effects. These are dose independent effects. The timing makes it more difficult to detect. These are carcinogenic activity, teratogenic activity, tardive dyskinesia with antipsychotics. These are often intact intractable once there you know it's very difficult to reverse these so better is to avoid these type of uh, delayed reactions then type e e stands for end of use reactions which occur on discontinuation of drug is too abrupt uh, the uh, steroid i gave you the example benzodiazepine if the patient has been taking for more than uh, three weeks or four weeks uh, then benzodiazepines need to be tapered you know otherwise there would be a withdrawal reaction beta blockers then they should not be stopped ab abruptly. Again, they should be uh, tapered down slowly. Then type F is unexpected failure of therapy. You know, sometimes because of the drug-drug interaction, uh, you know, there may be a failure of therapy. Uh, common interactions take place between anti-epileptic drugs, anti-tubercular drugs, and oral contraceptives. So be careful when the patient is having uh, these concomitant illnesses. So this may require Require this drug drug interaction may require increase in dosage, and uh, we need to consider the effect of concomitant therapy if required, uh, if, can, if allowed, permits permissible, uh, then you can stop the uh, drug or change the drug. But very often it happens uh, that you may have to continue with the medicine, but then consider increase in the dosage. Nowadays, uh, we are also talking about uh, patient reported ADRs. You know, these were, you know, all uh, as a professional uh, that we were reporting, uh, you know, but uh, for patients, you know, uh, uh, they report more of of the, uh, you know quality of life problems uh, uh, with the drugs you know uh, they give subjective descriptions of a adr and um, uh, seriousness you know uh, as i said even amongst the healthcare professional uh, we uh, you know mix up uh, seriousness with severity similarly patients may also have a different uh, opinion or beliefs or per perceptions about seriousness so you need to be uh, you know uh, you know open to be about it you know consider you know what do they mean uh, by saying that you know uh, to understand this uh, more uh, then common offenders you know particularly be careful with antibiotics anti neoplastic anti cancer drugs anticoagulant warfarin if any patient is on warfarin like heparin uh, you need to be very careful cardiovascular oral hypoglycemic agents insulins you know uh, they are very good effective uh, medicines they have given uh, you know new lease of life to diabetic patients, but if used in error or the dose is given wrongly, uh, the adverse effects may be exaggerated here. So, uh, so uh, painkillers are very commonly used, antihypertensive, CNS drugs, you know, these anti-cancer, uh, cardiovascular, CNS drugs, they account for around 70% of fatal ADR. So very, be very careful of this. How do you recognize ADR? You know, how do you know that a particular patient has an ADR? Can you write here in the chat box? Okay, uh, drop in quality of life, lab test results, uh, allergic reactions. Yes, it is, uh, you know, they can tell you. Yes, very good. Uh, you know, uh, someone has said any undesired effect after taking the medicine. Uh, you know, very good, you know. 
you know many of you know be careful you know when should you be suspecting uh, that adr has happened you know many a times disease and the adr may be similar you know in my hospital i get uh, you know a lot of patients who have tremors uh, as a part of the bipolar uh, manic disorder uh, but uh, valproate which is given for the treatment of this uh, um, um, bipolar affective disorder, disorder uh, also causes tremor so uh, the uh, clinician very often get confused whether it is the disease or is it the adr but remember that any symptom that appears soon after a new drug is started you know tremors would have been there earlier also but if the frequency has increased or the severity of the tremor has increased after starting a, a particular drug then consider this as an adr for example with ace inhibitors enalapril you know a patient was all right earlier but started having cough after starting an alapril. So this is more likely to be an ADR rather than any other uh, effect. And a, any ADR, any symptom which appears after an increase in dosage, uh, anything, any symptom which disappears when the drug is stopped, uh, you know, reappears when the drug is restarted. But uh, normally, uh, you know, we should not attempt to giving that drug again, if it particularly if it is a severe uh, area. But, uh, you know, temporal relationship, I always say temporal relationship between starting a drug and appearance of a new sim symptom suspect in terms of ADR. So uh, the uh, people who are at risk, uh, very young, very old people, pa those patients who are suffering from comorbid conditions and are on multiple medications uh, or they are not using those drugs properly, uh, timings are not proper, or uh, people who have end organ dysfunction, liver problems, kidney problems, have altered physiology such as in pregnancy, you may have more uh, side effects because of uh, the uh, physiological changes prior history of ADR, uh, extent and the duration of ex exposure. I told you type C and type D appears because of the chronic use. And some people are genetically pre predisposed. They have uh, certain genes, uh, you know, responsible for it. And there may be uh, racial differences between these genetic predispositions. So the management options you have is to discontinue the offending agents if it can be safely stopped, if it is life-threatening or intolerable. Most of the time, these are mild ADRs, which will, you know, disappear or the body, uh, you know, develops tolerance to them. For example, I'll give you amlodipine, headache, is a first symptom which will, uh, you know, ADR, uh, which will appear with uh, amlodipine. And the patient may, you know, say, you know, I, I have developed this headache. Oh, my ha blood pressure hasn't lowered, but another new problem has appeared. Uh, headache is, has come, you know, but if you know that this is, a, you know, tolerance will develop over a time, uh, the adherence to amlodipine would be better. So, you know, after 15, 20 days, if the patient continues to take amlodipine, this headache will disappear because of the tolerance development. So, but uh, yes, uh, if tolerance develops, you can continue. But if the patient is having uh, intolerable um, side effects, which are interfering with the life of the patient or are life-threatening, and where you have reasonable alternatives, uh, then you can discontinue the offending agent and replace it with a, uh, uh, another drug. But uh, you may have to continue if there are no reasonable alternatives. Is, uh, available and of course you have to follow up and reevaluate patients uh, uh, look at the patient's pro progress course of events response if there are any delayed reactions and uh, look at the specific monitoring parameters if there are any uh, so you have to also do the causality assessment for this you know uh, causality assessment uh, you know 
for you to be able to say what are the chances of this new symptom being due to the uh, you know ascribed to uh, as uh, adverse drug reaction uh, you need to do a causality assessment so here you consider prior reports of reaction the temporal relationship the challenge when you stop the offending drug and if the symptom disappears uh, this is called positive d challenge then re challenges you know you reintroduce this medicine again and if this new symptom appears again so this is called positive re challenge so you need to look into the dose response relationship that at lower dose you know if you give um, enalapril in 2.5 mg dose there was no cough but as soon as you increase the dose to 5 mg cough appeared so this is a dose response relationship here and the alternative etiologies uh, do not explain uh, the uh, or there is a past history of so based on these uh, parameters the causality out comes are defined highly probable probable possible or uh, doubtful or in regulatory terms they say likely or unlikely or they say related uh, to a, a drug new drug or unrelated to a new drug so uh, these are the various uh, uh, so normally uh, causality uh, uh, algorithm used are Kramer, Narenzo and Zones, and WHO U, uh, UMC, Uppsala Monitoring Center. They have given this algorithm. Most common, uh, commonly used are WHO, UMC, and Narenzo. Uh, you know, this is important to standardize this assessment of causality for all ADRs. You know, you, you have to use some algorithms here. Otherwise, it will be difficult to, uh, you know, evaluate, uh, you know, if people are using different criteria it becomes difficult to evaluate so this kind of uh, uh, you know questionnaire checklist is there based on that scoring is given so based on the score you know you uh, uh, classify them as definite probable possible or doubtful you know depending on the score here so then after you do the causality assessment you need to document and record this uh, you know medical records uh, description of the event how did you manage what was the outcome you know with a uh, full recovery with no um, uh, residue damage or was there any event so because uh, based on this there are also reporting responsibilities especially uh, if it is a new drug regulator uh, gives you the timelines for reporting so that timely actions are taken um, for those drugs which are already approved uh, many of the uh, healthcare organizations are undergoing uh, accreditation so they have a uh, mandate because patient safety is one of the big mandates of these accreditation programs so they may mandate reporting of this and um, there is a mandate for pharmaceutical manufacturers for reporting for first two years uh, of monitoring in India they need to uh, report uh, all area they need to actively monitor and report adrs to the drug regulatory authority and then uh, uh, reporting publishing in the medical literature helps you uh, in raising widespread awareness about now big question now uh, before us is who should report you know there are numerous uh, healthcare workers involved in uh, the patient care nurses pharmacists doctors all of those including patients all of us are having a piece of the puzzle and uh, unless we you know place all these pieces of puzzles together we will not be able to see the big picture many of us think that you know it's uh, you know i'm too busy or someone will report it is the you know we all all the time keep uh, saying uh, nurses can do it or pharmacists can do it but you know mind you uh, that this is everyone's responsibility to re report. Nowadays, there are mandates for patient-centered care, so patients also can report. So uh, they are also now invited for you know medication safety because all of us are the stakeholders. So all of us have the duty to report these adverse drug reactions. 
So, in, uh, you know, that is why in India, at least we have, I, I'm sure in uh, uh, your country also, uh, especially when a new drug is introduced, uh, uh, the safety monitoring requirements are very clearly delineated. You know, what a sponsor will do, what an investigator will do, the role of ethics committee, you know, the ethics committee just can, uh, cannot just say, uh, my role was to review the proposal, but they need to, uh, you know, uh, manage, uh, you know, see to it, supervise whether there is uh, any harm happening to the patient. So, and uh, that that's how regulatory bodies are also acting. So, uh, 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 pharmacovigilance program uh, coordinating center is there in most of the country, drug re regulatory authorities. Then if you have zonal or subzonal uh, or province uh, DRA offices, they are responsible. Uh, in India, uh, now this PVPI program has been extended to medical colleges, even the corporate hospitals, all autonomous institute, and it, uh, they are part of the public health programs as well. So there is a communication channel uh, and the flow of ADR reports, you know, how it would it, uh, you know, from the uh, ADR monitoring centers, uh, regional uh, centers, it goes to national center, and then from national center, it goes to Uppsala monitoring center. And, uh, you know, uh, all, uh, this is a two-way channel, you know, uh, not a one-way channel. Uh, so uh, all of them are communicating uh, with each other. So, uh, you know, it is, uh, it starts with the healthcare professionals, that we start reporting these ADRs. So usually uh, all of uh, all the countries have a ADR reporting forms available on the drug regulatory authorities. Uh, the information uh, on these forms are to be reported. Then these uh, national uh, centers, they do the causality assessment. Uh, then it goes, this is the VG flow is the program uh, app used in India. And then uh, this causality assessment is forwarded to uh, the national coordinating centers where it is analyzed and then uh, it goes to Uppsala monitoring center. Uh, the flow of the information, how it goes and who does this, uh, I think the pr in principle remains the same whether it is in Tan uh, Tanzania or any other country. So um, uh, mandatory timelines have been defined that within uh, 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 24 hours uh, investigator will report within seven days, uh, you know, like that uh, those timeline timelines have been defined for each stakeholder so that uh, you know quick action is taken uh, this is the kind of form uh, that we have in india uh, for suspected adverse drug reaction uh, reporting so uh, you know uh, this is important because if you want to take a decision to ban a drug or not to ban a drug this has to be data driven uh, you know, it can't be, I feel, you know, it is like this, the other person may see. So Rafi Coxib, for example, you know, um, caused between 88,000 to more than that one, 10 million cardiac events. So it forced Merck to voluntarily withdraw it from the US market. Uh, unless you have data, you know, so this may then in turn prompt a ban in uh, other countries, uh, you know, although you may not have observed that many uh, cardiac events because of the underreporting. So it depends on the regulator, but the regulator is more confident of his decision if it is data driven. So now um, traditionally reporting methods are voluntary and are non-automated. That is why, that is one reason why there is so much of, uh, you know, under-reporting. Um, only 6% of the adverse events are identified through traditional incident uh, reporting methods. So, uh, of course, spontaneous reporting system uh, is good. It helps in uh, detection of new, rare, serious side effects, but under-reporting is the major weakness. So, under-reporting delays uh, the uh, detection and identification of the safety problems. So, and also uh, in spontaneous reporting, severity of the reaction uh, may vary, you know, 
uh, some people think only severe ones are to be reported. Uh, you know, reporting varies from the time from market introduction. If the drug had been there for many years in the market, many people think that there is no need to report uh, this ADR to the drug regulatory authority. Uh, and it also depends on, you know, how, uh, you know, strongly are you uh, promoting the reporting system and uh, publicity of the specific association. So that, uh, you know, leads to the action. Um, various reasons people do not report uh, because of the lack of awareness or, you know, they don't know what ADRs are, how to recognize them. Many times, you know, uh, people think they are trivial, mild, you know, there is no problem. And how one reported case uh, will make a difference, you know, so it doesn't matter if I don't report. And uh, many times uh, they are not able to differentiate between disease and the ADR. So th there is a difficulty uh, and some people think, you know, uh, unless you are very sure that this is area, then only you should report. No, this is not true. Uh, you know, there is no need for the, uh, you know, for you to establish the causality. Causality can be assessed later, but if you suspect that this could be the adverse drug reaction, uh, then you can report. But, uh, you know, many of us are also scared of the legal action or, you know, who will fill the form? I don't have the time to do this, you know, uh, it is interfering with my work. And some people say, so what, you know, I don't know, I reported uh, some of the ADRs, but I don't know what was the what was done to my report, whether any action uh, was taken or not. So these are various reasons not to report. So uh, you know, but at least you know if you are not able to report all the ADRs, but at least report uh, ADRs to newly marketed drugs or new drugs which have been added to your hospital formulary because you don't have much experience with that drug. So at least be watchful of these drugs and report this. You know, if you have a serious reaction, uh, if you have a serious interaction, must report. Any ADR which is not mentioned in the package insert of a uh, drug, should be reported. Uh, sometimes as a medical professional, we say if it is unusual or an interesting one, it must be reported. And, uh, you know, also, if you observe that the frequency of a given reaction has increased, you know, in a given ward, it happened, you know, uh, they were using morphine and uh, suddenly they were seeing more of vomiting uh, with the product. So this should be reported. Uh, then you can find out the causality assessment, whether it was, and especially any adverse e effects, uh, any medicine used in pregnancy, children, this should be reported. And um, uh, unusual lack of efficacy, uh, when you suspect that it could be because of the pharmaceutical defect, uh, it, it should be reported. Um, you know, One of you had written in the chat box about the recent event of uh, that cough syndrome up uh, you know casualties happening so this is this that happened because of the use of glycol uh, polyethylene glycol uh, the content were higher than the permissible uh, content uh, of uh, uh, this uh, peg in the uh, use as a preservative or excipient in the cough syrup that was responsible so reporting of these cases helped in identification of uh, you know hazard posed by the substandard medicine Medication. And other people were protected from, uh, you know, suffering from harm uh, because of the action taken by the authorities, maybe because of the media, you know, as that's why I said, the, all of us are the stakeholder, anyone can report, anyone can spark this, uh, you know, discussion, and ultimate aim is to protect the patient, if you find that there are any quality problems, uh, these uh, and uh, these should be reported. 
whom to report. Many of us, we do not report uh, uh, ADRs because we are not clear about what is the, uh, you know, where to report, whom to report, how to report. So, uh, you know, generally that, that should be known to everyone. Uh, you know, uh, there should be a publication about this, to a toll free number should be there. Uh, you know, it, it should be easy, you know, app based reporting is, uh, are better because then people can uh, you know um, comply with it so uh, is spontaneous reporting enough certainly no uh, we need to intensive have intensive monitoring for inpatients you know uh, at least 10 to 20 percent of current inpatients you should actively look for whether they suffer from any uh, adverse reactions or not at least look for you know any medicine which was abruptly discontinued any medicine which was uh, uh, dose was reduced or, or any uh, you know order for a tracer or a trigger substance or when you suddenly ask for a special test or a drug levels then you should suspect that perhaps there was a uh, adverse drug reaction these uh, these uh, you know tracers or triggers you know uh, they prompt they flag that uh, you know something may have happened to the patient. Uh, for example, suddenly if you use diphenhydramine, suddenly uh, you if you uh, a dextrose fifty percent is advised for a patient. Normally there are no indications for dextrose fifty percent. It is given only in case of severe hypoglycemia. Plumazenil is used as a benzodiazepine antagonist. Normally has no indications. Only in benzodiazepine overdose and will be used. Naloxone is used for opioid like that. So if you see any of these drug or lab triggers, you know, um, um, uh, liver enzymes going up, uh, blood urea ni nitrogen going up, hemoglobin dropping, INR uh, in, uh, increasing. So all these are triggers that perhaps there was some adverse drug reaction and then you can study. Uh, so if you have a computerized, um, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, physician order in entry systems you can use uh, you know these alerts you can fix these alerts in your uh, system and it will tell you if any of these triggers are there so you can uh, study those in detail so how do you uh, you know one is that uh, you know you can facilitate uh, by reporting uh, involving patients families caregivers uh, then use various channels discharge document is one of the the important uh, sources uh, you, you have to develop uh, public education materials you know what are the do's and don'ts when to take not to take antibiotic use you know leftover uh, at discharge particularly you can uh, teach the uh, patient about all the details you know how to take it dose duration and all that so that there are no mistakes or no misunderstanding reconciliation can be done at the discharge so that uh, you know, uh, many a times patients do not report herbal being uh, medicines being taken by or the medicines taken uh, over the counter uh, by these patients. So the, which may have significant interaction. Many people believe that her herbal uh, medicines, which uh, since they are natural, have no side effect. They, they are harmless. It is not true. But when, you know, they, they may be safe on their own, but when taken with modern medicine, may have some unacceptable ADR. So at discharge, use this opportunity to give verbal as well as written information, use medication calendars, schedules, cards, charts, pill boxes, etc. Uh, to improve upon patients' uh, education you may uh, on many of the corporate hospitals have a uh, two-way messaging systems on their website so this can help uh, them in improving their knowledge uh, even uh, you know you need to promote uh, this reporting of side effect they are also clueless about what to report so you can educate them you know what what all constitutes ADR maybe you can give them some examples of red flag signs you know when you have rashes or when you have um, signs of toxicity so you can ed educate depending on the scope of your hospital so to summarize 
you know uh, the uh, medicines uh, uh, you know on one hand they save life improve quality of life but at the same time can be hazardous dangerous and how dangerous a drug is depends on the skills of the prescriber depends on the you know preparedness uh, of the patients on this so who for this has prescribed five months for medication safety and under this uh, you know uh, uh, the laid emphasis on you know when you start a medication when the patient takes medication when you add another drug to a patient so from time to time review medication should be reviewed and how to stop these all these are the moments of the uh, patient safety so we need to be very careful when uh, doing this i hope uh, i i am uh, you know within time limit uh, i think uh, i can stop here Thank and you everyone so and everyone has a role to play you know uh, Anything yes. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sangita. That was very, very informative. Yeah, I think uh, the participants have really learned uh, a lot, even myself. So maybe we can now use the remaining few minutes to go through a few questions which have been posed. So there is a question which is asking, how would we classify negative adverse effects resulting from drug addictions? Uh, uh, ADR is ADR. I don't know what do you mean by negative, uh, you know, adverse effects. Addiction, abuse liability is also the uh, adverse effect. Uh, you know, uh, any for example, when this Zolpidem Z drugs were in, in uh, you know uh, introduced, uh, they were uh, introduced as uh, one of the uh, uh, advantage they had uh, was that they are uh, there is no dependence to these uh, uh, Z drugs. But now with evidence, because of the reporting of this addiction liability uh, or dependence liability of a drug, now we know that even uh, de dependence develops to these Z, Z drugs as well. So, uh, you know, I think we need not get into this, whether this is positive or negative. Our job is if you find a new thing happening or, uh, you know, and which has not been adequately explained so far, it should be reported. Okay. Uh, there's another question which is saying, what category or type of ADRs caused by cosmetic agents are caused by cosmetic agents? Uh, cosmetics, uh, okay, yes. Uh, Drugs are very well regulated. Uh, cosmetics in some countries, uh, they are part of the new drug. So they are also considered as a new drug. But in some countries, they are not so well regulated uh, when uh, they are introduced. So maybe the requirements uh, for study of uh, the new cosmetic or its effect on the skin or other uh, impact of those cons uh, cosmetics may not be that well studied, you know, when they are introduced. But now more and more awareness is there. People are asking uh, that cosmetics also should be uh, regulated strictly, rigorously as for the new drugs. You know, because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, absorption can take place from the skin and it can have deleterious effect. Thank you. Maybe there's a hand. I think there's a hand by Edwin. 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 Kindly, Edwin, you can ask the question. Yes, please. Let the person using my name kindly to ask. You know, please. Yeah, I didn't get your question. Can you just repeat it? Edwin, you have raised up your hand. Do you have a question? Okay, uh, maybe I'm we can. I'm doing that. There is somebody who's, uh, who was doing using my name, but let him ask okay. the question, please. May he has forgotten that he's using my name. Okay, fine. 
And uh, maybe I should also ask all participants, make sure that you are using your own name because uh, when we are pre the certificates are automatically generated, so it might create some problems, okay? Yeah. So make sure you are changing the name that is, uh, is not yours. I know if we have yeah. shared the link, then someone might have used the same link so they appear as the same person. Okay, maybe I can bring out uh, another question. This, this will be the last question that what can be the universal legal implications that uh, results from failure to manage ADRs? I think someone wants to learn about legal implications that might result from the failure to manage ADRs, yeah. Uh, while on one hand, uh, we are, um, you know, trying to motivate people to report, but if you make legal implications for, you know, uh, fear of legal implication is one of the major reasons for not to report. People don't want to get into that problem, you know, uh, you know, because people, patient may think, you know, they don't understand the difference between the ADR and they don't understand, you know, anything can happen, side effects can happen with the medicine. For them, anything untoward, anything which, which was not expected, uh, they they take it as medical negligence and at least it uh, you know we are going through that same phase here in india you know people because although on one hand there is um, uh, you know improved awareness amongst the patient but at the same time uh, you know this awareness uh, they because they are not able to assess this properly so any uh, you know negative outcome they think is the negligence so making it a legal, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, specifying legal implication for healthcare uh, providers um, will actually uh, interfere or will, you know, uh, you know, decrease the reporting. But on one hand, we want more and more people to report so that we know uh, what's exactly being happening uh, on ground. But if you make it legal, uh, you know, then people may take some punitive action, administrative action against that person. They may think that the drug was given wrongly or, you know, why a doctor has given me a drug which has not been adequately studied, you know, why, uh, you know, they may misconstrue this as a, that they are experimenting on me. Uh, you know, if it is uh, happening uh, in the post-marketing phase, you know, then it's perfectly all right. But then, you know, you have to be, instead of saying legal implication, one has to be careful and use only those drugs which are well studied. Drugs for which adverse drug reactions have been well documented. You know, don't go for off-label use of medicine. You know, what happens in actual situation is many of the drugs, in uh, they have been approved for certain indications. But Actually, in practice, they are being used for other indications which are not mentioned in the package insert. So that mm -hmm. makes it a off-label use of a medicine. So if you are using a you know drug for an off-label uh, indication, then there are chances that you may get into uh, trouble if serious uh, ADR happened to this patient. So I always say that you prescribe within your uh, or dispense within your legal limits only what, what is approved by your drug regulatory authority don't venture mm -hmm. outside this you know otherwise you'll get into trouble thank you dr sangita uh, time is not on our side but i see we have uh, two hands there's one for olufemi and i also have another one from joel kibona joel are you there if you have raised up your hand, please unmute. unmute. Olufemi, are you there? Yes, thank yes, you very you. much, uh, moderator. My name is uh, Olufemi. I want to live from yeah, Can you go straight to the question, please? We have so two I, minutes. I, I yeah. actually put it on the chat box that uh, okay. what are we doing with respect to simplifying the reporting channels, especially with non-professionals like patients and their carers at home? I believe this okay. may help to drive up the um, rate of reporting. Thank you. Uh, yes, Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sangita. Sorry. Yeah, very good question. Uh, because Dr. Sangita. Need... Yes. Can yes. we can we also take one for Joel and then you respond to all of them together, please? Okay. So that we can close the Q and A. Joel. 
Hey, thank you very much. I just wanted to know how did the market authorization holders and LTR themselves also get engaged in follow up and making a collection of these ADR as it's one of the regulatory requirements? Because you find they are not directly involved with the patients or their distribution line ends to the patients. So how do themselves make follow up and also collect the information so they can be able to compile as for regulatory requirements? Yes, Dr. Sangita. Uh, uh, I didn't get the question. Uh, you know, can you just repeat, uh, you know, uh, the last question? So I'm just asking that uh, market authorization holders together maybe of local representatives are required by law that they are supposed to also follow up for the safety and also take all the information and regarding all the ADR that may happen into the market. Mm -hmm. So now I think they're not directly related into the market or into the hospitals. How do they create forums and make follow up of these products? Safety. Uh, you know, the first question, I think it, these are related questions. Uh, you know, yes. that was about the, uh, you know, how patients can report it. Uh, you know, uh, Social media is one of the, so, uh, you know, uh, way of raising awareness as well as you can use this for reporting. And if you have a number, particular number uh, that can be, you know, or site or a portal or an app, you know, uh, that you, you can create awareness about. That's how uh, we have started doing it in India. Uh, so people are using those apps and reporting those. So uh, uh, perhaps uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the local uh, group, you know, which you are referring to, you know, first thing is about raising awareness, you know, what they are, you know, they should understand this in a proper sense only. They should not take it as a negligence or something wrong has happened or something wrong was done to them. So they also need to be empowered. They ne also need to be empowered to recognize these ADRs. So I told you uh, public education materials can be used and displayed those can be displayed at various waiting uh, lounges in the hospital uh, where uh, patients are waiting they can go through this and you can develop these materials according to the scope of the hospital uh, you know for example mine is a neuropsychiatry institute so I would like to uh, educate them about ed epilepsy I would like to uh, educate them about the headache and then you know um, what are the red flag signs stroke like that so uh, depending on the uh, mandate you know one can uh, decide that uh, uh, I think uh, this two-way messaging on the uh, website of a hospital or a organization that's another very good way of engaging with the patients uh, those portals can be used uh, they will help you in identifying those patients and they can uh, seek uh, medical care in a timely manner. I think I got it right. I got the question right and I answered it, uh, you know. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sangita. This was very interesting and I see there are other hands on, but time is not on our side. So we hope to have uh, more of this kind of discussions in the future. So for now, uh, we go through our last poll please. And we thank all of you for being here. Please attend the last poll as a feedback to us, as we are intending to continue with these kind of interventions. Yeah, I think they're very useful, particularly for on-job skills upgrading. So please attend the poll. It just take like one minute, just go through the poll one minute. The certificate link has also been sent through your chat box. So you just click the link, you get your certificate automatically. And the slide deck will be shared after we finish the webinar. Please, can we attend the poll quickly? We have one minute to go. Please, yes, please. More people, please go through the post web uh, post uh, webinar feedback is very key. Very important. As I said, the link for the auto-generated certificate has been sent through the chat box. So later you can click, you can get it. Yes, I need more people. More people at least so that we have 
uh, of your feedback, please. Please, can I get more? Please, one more minute. Can I, can we do yes? Thank you. Yes, thank you. One more person. Thank you. Please. More people. Yes, please. Can I get more? Oh, please. So we have 61% who participated in the poll. Can we end the poll? At least we got 63%. Okay. So 63% uh, of us participated in this poll. And we had some few questions. We wanted to know whether we have met, we have matched your expectations. And uh, 53, that is all of those who attended the poll indicated that we have matched the expectations. So it is 100%. Uh, question number two is asking how likely are you to recommend the webinar? So it's a scale of one to 10. We have observed that 87% uh, score uh, ranked it from eight to 10. So highly ranked, thank you. Uh, the question number three, will you join us for such future webinars? 96% indicated yes, thank you. And um, we would like to know if you have taken any courses with Empower School of Health. We realize that 64% uh, have not yet taken any course from Empower School of Health, but they are interested. So you can go through the website, their website, and look for uh, opportunities for skills upgrading. Empower School of Health has an expert on e-learning courses. So you can still upgrade your skills while you are still at your workplace. You don't need to leave your job. So this is very important. Yeah, and uh, as I said, um, thank you uh, for the poll. As I said, you ha we have the auto-generated link for your certificates. Please click it and you get your certificate automatically. But I also wanted to let you know that uh, we have developed uh, these same courses for TMDA Tanzania, uh, the pharmacovigilance as an e-learning module, but there is also one on periodic surface reporting, risk management, market authorization, and also, as I said, uh, and good distribution uh, practices. So uh, if you are in Tanzania, if you are with TMDA, I'm sure as uh, we launch these courses, you'll be able to, uh, to, uh, to, to attend these courses online, okay? So thank you everyone for attending this webinar. We really appreciate for part your participation. Uh, thank you so much, Shimelis. Thank you so much, Dr. Sangita. Always good to have you on board. Very, very insightful. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone. I've taken some emails for some of you you find me writing to you so that we keep on going uh, in terms of networking and uh, collaborations in these particular uh, subjects. Thank you so much. And this is Gladness. I've sent my email through the chat box. If you have any questions, any recommendations that you think we can have this short time, but very intensive learning such as this webinar, please let me know. Just send me through my, uh, send me the information through my email. Yeah, thank you everyone.